it was well known even that SARS-CoV-1, that one was a, or obviously a horrific virus that killed over 800 people, but you know, it was different, a different sort of situation. But we knew that UV could kill SARS-CoV-1. We knew that it could kill other coronaviruses. Types of microorganisms are affected or more susceptible than others. There's this kind of hierarchy that we talk about in kind of general disinfection. And what you'll see on the screen here is just at the bottom of it, uh, of that list is what is most susceptible to disinfectants. And in, and in particular, we're talking UV here. And that's like your envelope viruses. And then just above that are like your vegetative bacteria. And it just gets progressively more difficult to, to disinfect with UV, these other microorganisms. And so what we often care most about are the things that are uh, most prevalent in, say, a hospital environment, things like, you know, SARS-CoV-2 or uh, MRSA. But there's, it's, really, it's really interesting because, you know, bacteria uh, take more UV energy than certain envelope viruses to disinfect them. And that's just, it just is kind of a phenomenon of nature. And so there's a whole host of literature that's available in the open literature and scientific journals and whatnot that document the, the level of fluence or the dosage of UVC necessary in order to kill these microorganisms. Now, there's something kind of interesting there that we probably want to note. If you, Wait, I, I just want to ask you one thing, okay. because you mentioned COVID mm -hmm. and we all have COVID on our minds, yeah, right? We're living true. in the COVID world. <laughs> Can UVC radiation be effective against COVID? Yes, it can. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic era, if you will, in early 2020, we get this question all the time, right? What we had to say was, we believe so, but we don't have the full data yet. And that came from, you know, our experience with disinfecting or inactivating other envelope viruses, of which SARS-CoV-2, of the coronavirus family, we all know. And it was well known, even that SARS-CoV-1, that one was a, or obviously a horrific virus that killed over 800 people, but you know, it was different, a different sort of situation. But we knew that UV could kill SARS-CoV-1. We knew that it could kill other coronaviruses. We just didn't have the data. Why are we wearing these surgical masks? And the answer is to protect your fellow man or woman uh, from you if you are sick, especially with this pandemic, because now we know there's breakthrough infection, People can be infected and subclinical, but still breathing out replication competent virus. We know that, okay? As well as subclinical people that are subclinically infected, like young, healthy people. And uh, so their immune system is more robust than, than yours, probably Brad and, and mine. Uh, as, as people that are sophisticated, right? Not older, but sophisticated. And um, so your expiration is at high velocity. And, and, and so a human being will generate a exhalation that just for a microsecond, it'll reach 90 meters a second. It's incredibly high, just just for that exhalation, even though you don't even really realize it, it's subcon you know, and, and not conscious. Uh, and when you do that, it pushes air and exhaled breath particles out and it pushes it into that surgical mask because it can't make the turn to get to those areas of, of lowest pressure and escape that mask. We hear a lot about um, uh, C. diff and MRSA, uh, but, Christian, you're here today to talk about something that's been emerging as a superbug right. in the hospital systems. Tell us about candida. Yeah, so candida oris, while maybe not one of the most uh, talked about uh, pathogens in the healthcare system, probably most notably because it's a new emerging uh, pathogen, has really taken the stage uh, starting back uh, in 2016, um, right? So in 2016, we had roughly about five states with clinical cases here in the U.S. And you fast forward today, now we have over 20 states with clinical cases here in the U.S. And of those 20 states, we have roughly four of them with over an act of 101 cases with Candida auris. So something that really wasn't spoke of, really wasn't on the map, uh, has appeared. It's taken root. And not only has it taken root in the U.S., uh, as of February 21 uh, this year, uh, they stopped reporting uh, actively country by country because it had become global. So we had seen enough cases from enough emerging and developing countries that at this point it is, it is a global pathogen. 
Well, tell us a little bit about candida because most of the pathogens uh, that we're familiar with are bacterial or virus, but uh, candida is a, a fungus or maybe technically a yeast. What, what more can you tell us about that? And how do you typically treat those kind of uh, pathogens? Yeah, correct. So, uh, you know, one of the biggies uh, that we've obviously uh, spoke about and, and we've developed technologies around that still shield for many years is, uh, and, and most publicly well-known, we MRSA, right? So to delineate, that's a bacteria, right? And it's a bacteria that is a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, right? So we created this uh, by the overusage of broad-spectrum antibiotics, and that's how we would treat bacteria. However, with Candida auris being a, a fungi and specifically a yeast, uh, that would need to be treated with an antifungal. Uh, and uh, there are species of Candida auris that are completely drug resistant at this time. So that leaves us with a lot of options to where we want to really prevent and mitigate this pathogen being in the environment uh, so that we do not end up with a clinical case, a colonization, and then potentially uh, you know, an infection. You mentioned the PCR right. testing. Was that the only kind of testing you did? And maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit about what type of tests are available and what the difference is, at least in the most sure. general sense, for them to understand. No, absolutely. And 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 I'll put my asterisks in here, which you knew I was going to have to. I, I'm not a medical. I'm not trained. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Um, I just happen to be around it a lot. You know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week for a while. We tend to learn a little bit. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's also a lot of information out there. The hard part for us is how do we wade through that? How do we understand what's best? And I was on a, I was on a call last year. I, I was put on a panel to talk about COVID with some healthcare experts, some business experts. And they asked me, what's the best thing that you can do in, in the middle of COVID? How can you actually help each other? Just try, do a little bit, wear your mask if you can, social distance if you can, wash your hands one or two times extra if you can. Um, and that get into testing, test if you can. You know, there's misinformation about testing is the hard part. So PCR is a, is a you're looking for the infected piece of DNA. It's, a, it's a, been around for a long time. And it's a way we can find the COVID-19 virus. But it takes time. It takes six hours to run it in the lab. It was taking 24 to 48 and sometimes two weeks just to get the testing back. So many other tests came in also. In terms of testing, PCR is the 100% most conclusive for an active infection. Now that's great. If you're actively infected, technically you're contagious, but that's not necessarily true because PCR is also extremely sensitive. In the case of my dad, he tested positive for two months, although he was probably only contagious for two weeks or less. But you know, he still had and the antibodies the and he had the DNA that the PCR was uh, detecting. Right? right, you could see just a trace of the infected DNA for that PCR test long time after you're contagious. So that was a hard part too, is, is who is contagious and who's not contagious. So again, try a little bit. If you get test positive for COVID, just quarantine for a little bit, please. You know, that's all we're asking is stay away from everybody else for a while. What more can you tell us sure. about the technology that's going into these masks and why it's superior or yeah. potentially game changing? Yeah, so what we have essentially done is micronize electrostatic precipitation. And that's something that's never been done before. Um, you know, electrostatic precipitation has been around since the Industrial Revolution began, and it's used to, you know, keep pollutants out of the environment. And, you know, whenever you see a big manufacturing facility or plant, you know, those big smokestacks are gigantic electrostatic precipitators. Uh, so what we've done is micronize it and adapt it to the human being uh, in order to protect the airway from biopathogens. And it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's uh, so our mass technology has a little cylinder and through the middle of it is a rod that's emitting electrons. And then the inner wall of the cylinder is a collector plate. So what happens when you breathe in and you have, uh, you know, your breath containing, you know, virus or pathogens, uh, those pathogens attach to the electrons that are coming off of this emitter rod. And then those electrons are attracted to the positively charging collector plate. And then what you breathe in is clean air. And it's all done um, with, uh, without really any impediment to breathing. So very, very low pressure drop, if any at all. Uh, and, you know, what we found in our initial rounds of research with Chad is that we removed virtually all virus from the airway, and that's with virus 
uh, being pumped in at you know four times normal breathing, uh, and also at a concentration of hundreds of millions of times you know viral concentration, and that's a viral concentration you would never find in the natural world. So, you know, so the tech performed. I mean, just remarkably well. It exceeded all of our expectations. Um, uh, under the most rigorous testing conditions. And so that's when, you know, we were like, oh my gosh, we, I think we have something here. And it is a healthcare show. We talked about this. Why are we talking about IT? Well, healthcare is all IT now, right? With the implementation of electronic medical records, it's completely IT centric. And if healthcare is going to be IT centric, then the IT needs to be infection control centric. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in healthcare and how you focus on uh, healthcare and other verticals. I mean, it's everywhere, right? The, it, you know, it's devices. It's from the waiting room, from, from from where you check in to the OR to the ER. I mean, it's everywhere. It's it's you know from that tablet to that to how you gonna charge it? Okay, how are you gonna use it once you dock it? Okay, you need a keyboard, things like that. It's just all over the place, right? And and what guess what happens? They worry, you know, the the healthcare. Again, you know, they have smart folks there, but they're thinking about, okay, we got to deploy this new device. They get the device. Oh my goodness, we forgot that you've got to be able to connect it to it, or or, or clean maybe it. the network, or maybe the network's not, you know, as stable as you thought, or then you got security risk with HIPAA. It just, I mean, you could go on and on and on. So nine times out of ten, ninety percent of it is thought through, and you think, oh my goodness, what about that? Or or you have to troubleshoot, right? So. But I really believe you're right. Everything that involved in healthcare is, I mean, I remember going to Hams at first, you know, 10, because you, you guys invited me. We went down there like 11 years ago and it was a little section of IT, right? Keep me honest here, but I think it was yeah. maybe maybe 50 or less boosts, if you will, of, of some kind of IT. And it really wasn't IT, but they called it that. And now, I mean, it's a whole, you know, hundreds, right, of, of different folks. And, and we're happy to be able to support a lot of those. And a lot of the, traditional IT manufacturers now have realized, listen, we have to have something that is relevant to that. And it may be their, it may be their same device they've been making, but they understand, you know, I'm seeing white papers and all kinds of different you know, scenarios talking about how it fits in that space. It's, it's on everybody's mind, especially the last 20 months, obviously. Um, but it's something that's not going to go away. Not only has to work well, but it has to be appealing so that people will embrace it. Uh, and that's what the next generation devices are uh, much lighter. Uh, and this is the direction where we're now moving. So this is the new the prototype. This is the latest uh, variation, correct? Uh, there are a few variations okay. for different industries. Okay. For example, we have the ability to adapt uh, to an existing shroud. In other words, many companies have developed uh, a comfortable interface and fit and straps uh, that's acceptable in their appearance. And uh, we don't want to reinvent or do the work that's already been done. So what we created is an interface to existing masks where we can offer our functionality. And the key part is not only does it remove particles and protects against the virus, but it also is easy to breathe through. So it's not that workload that we get for wearing an N95. And I can share that with, with the uh, audience here is that uh, when we work in a hospital and in the ICU, and sometimes the hospital has a majority of patients in the ICU on respirators, and uh, we see the terrible numbers, but yes, we do see the sick patients, you know, uh, and it's also true, some people, uh, my younger daughter had COVID some months ago, but it, it was a low level light illness. Uh, so, but don't let it fool you. Just because many people have a light illness, there are some people that are terribly ill uh, and fatally ill. Well, the word terrible and fatal are not that far apart. 
Uh, <laughs> if you end up 30 days in the intensive yeah, care sure. unit and you end up with neurological and respiratory sequela, sure. that's no life either. Right. Organ failure, dialysis, it's all, it's all terrible. Sometimes yes. death may be easier mm. than the survival with a lot of problems. Terrible. I see the uh, prototype system on your desk there. Is that <laughs> something you can show our audience? And uh, I, I mean, I can pick it up how again. It works, yeah. Yeah, it's an appearance prototype. Um, the screen is touch screen. Uh, the device weighs about 2.24 pounds. Um, this, this was our first appearance prototype that I happen to have here. Uh, we've done some modifications to how it holds for a small hand, large hand, make sure it's uh, effective. The cartridge, which we have a couple of different ones. One is actually, uh, this, is, this is actually a prototype, but the back of it does have the, a chip in it, which is the kind of the brains of the, of the system. This also has a, um, an EEPROM in it. So it's a smart cartridge. Um, and you'd place it into the device and then whatever workflow we have for the particular analyte, then you would follow that. This is connected, so it has connectivity, Wi-Fi, USB, cellular, um, also has a GPS capability. So there's high capability in this device um, to report out, to monitor if we're using a flow cell versus our, uh, versus our um, you know, single, single use cartridge. Um, but even that would be able to locate where am I, what did it do, uh, what kind of test did I perform, who was it on, and then that data goes up into, uh, up into the cloud, and then we can disperse that data depending on you know, what, what kind of regulation. You know, HIPAA laws cover a lot of this when you're in healthcare, so we have to make sure we're HIPAA compliant. Uh, but when you're outside of that law, it's still you know, who owns the data, and there's some important things that we've done to uh, make sure that that is kept um, appropriately. So small unit, you can see it in my hand. Um, I have a pretty big hand, uh, but we've placed it in uh, my wife's hand and other folks who have smaller hands, very comfortable. Um, two and a quarter pounds um, is its current weight, uh, though there are a lot of things we can do to bring that down. Um, and the current form factor can be adjusted for certain applications. Has the fact that many students are turning to virtual meetings of learning impacted the demand for Belkin products in schools if so, how have you adjusted? Yes. So we, we uh, last year when all the students went home, we immediately had to, had to readjust. We we pivoted in in some very dynamic ways uh, with, with our product focus. Uh, for instance, as students started to come back uh, this this past uh, fall, uh, Chromebooks had already proliferated on the market by the millions. Uh, now, those Chromebooks proliferating by the millions meant these, these students now have to carry those Chromebooks to and from school. So we ramped up our processes for Chromebook cases, and, and we became a huge supplier of Chromebook cases just I mean, but, but by the tens of thousands, literally, uh, per school district. Uh, so, so, yes, it has demanded a, a great deal of, uh, of pivoting and adjusting to the current demand on the market. And uh, I think our numbers have shown that we, we've done quite well at that. <laughs> well, I thought that was a great question. Yes, it um, is. What about in the broader market, in the consumer space? Because same thing is happening in corporate America, right? And, and around the right. world that we're all right. going home to work. Work from Did we home. have the equipment yes. that we needed before this? And if not, we yes. have to acquire it. And have you guys seen an impact from that? Well, yes, we have. And re really, uh, docks and adapters are one area that the work from home uh, sort of practice has demanded. Uh, when you take that laptop uh, from your desk at work, and now you're working from you're doing your work from home, uh, it does uh, demand a different set of uh, equipment than you may have had before. So we, we've seen adapters, docks, uh, ver various connecting cables uh, uh, starting to, well, it, they have flown off the shelf and really get, continue to. So we're, we're trying to keep up. If you're waiting for a product, please, we're trying to keep up, it's coming. <laughs>